Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. So whatever shall we talk about today? Well, we're going to be talking about the entrepreneurial mindset. So you guys have probably heard about entrepreneurs before, right? Entrepreneurs start up Facebook, entrepreneurs uh, start little uh, startup companies that uh, eventually get bought for a billion dollars. So obviously entrepreneurial stuff is really good, all right? But what I think we miss often is that uh, entrepreneurial, it really is a mindset, all right? So you don't actually have to be starting up a brand new company <laughs> to have an entrepreneurial mindset. You can have a job in which you're providing value for a company, and the reason the company hired you in the first place is because they wanted you to act in an entrepreneurial way, all right? So that sounds like a good deal, but if they want us to act that way, it sounds like we should probably spend a little bit of time and go ahead and uh, figure out exactly what that actually means. So let's go ahead and see what we can find out. So in today's class, there's a few learning objectives. What are they? Well, we want to learn the meaning of being entrepreneurial. So that sounds like a good thing to do. No question about that whatsoever. We want to identify and discuss the elements of value creation. Creating value sounds like a good thing. Explain the utility of a value proposition canvas or tool. And we'll participate in a value proposition activity. Bring it on, I say. All right, fundamental question that I think that we all have is, hey, when can I become entrepreneurial? Is there a certain age? Do I have to become like 30? Do I have to become 30 before I can become entrepreneurial? Is there like a, a cutoff on this sort of stuff? Well, maybe it's worthwhile to sit back for just a moment and think about your career so far. <laughs> Career? I don't think I've had a career yet. I got to graduate from college. No, you've actually had a career so far. You've done stuff, okay? If you've done stuff, then we consider that to be part of a career. So you accumulated important basic information in high school. <laughs> At least you were supposed to, okay? And congratulations. Now you're in college, okay? Why did you go to high school? <laughs> well, because you had to. That was at least part of it, okay? But ultimately, your high school had one thing to do. Okay, your high school was designed to teach you how to learn new material, how to become a learner. That was the purpose of all those classes you took in high school and all that homework that you turned in. It was teach you how to learn. Of course, after you got done with high school, you went on to college. And here in college, our goal, hopefully, if we do it well, is to teach you how to think. So you've got the material. There's no question about that whatsoever. But if you take the material and if you take in the material, what are you supposed to do with it? What can you do with it? The university is doing its job. Ultimately, you will be able to answer that question for yourself. So being entrepreneurial, hmm, how do we actually do this? Good question. So an entrepreneurial mindset means that you work on creating new inventions and you're going to be able to recognize innovative projects. Sounds good. Once you are done, You'll be joining the professional world, and that's when you will get a chance to implement the knowledge and skills that you've accumulated during your time at USF. The entrepreneurial mindset starts with, and I'm so sorry because this is part of the package, hard work, and unfortunately, it does require long hours. We can think about this in terms of swimming. Man, if you and I said, hey, let's go swimming, and you didn't know how to go swimming, <laughs> it's not going to turn out well. We're going to jump in the pool, and you're going to basically, well, assuming that you can reach the bottom, you're just going to stand there. If you can't reach the bottom, then you're just going to sit there and flail as I do laps around you, right? If you want to be able to swim, and if you want to be able to win a swimming competition, you best be knowing how to swim. If you don't know how to swim, you're going to sink and hit the bottom, right? So it sounds like if you want to be entrepreneurial, you got to know how to be entrepreneurial, right? You want to be a winner and you want to be better than everybody else that you're working with. Sort of a natural thing. Entrepreneurship is being in constant change and also having the ability to improve designs and processes over and over again. Meanwhile, acknowledging <laughs> as we all do, that you will make some mistakes. That's a part of life. Get over it and move on. All right, 
So if we're going to be all this entrepreneurial stuff, somehow I think the customer, the people that we deliver products to is somehow important. So let's see how if we can figure out how we do this. So if you want to deliver a product to a customer, of course, the very first question you have to answer is, um, who are your customers? I mean, the world has a lot of people in it. Let's agree on that, right? Well, that's great that there's a lot of people in the world, but you don't care about all of them. The ones you care about are the people that are going to use or receive your product. If you're making a product for them, the product's got to do something for them. What is their problem that they're faced? Or what is the opportunity that they want to take advantage of that they're going to need your product to do something with? Now, you haven't given them a product yet. <laughs> and yet somehow they continue to exist. How's that going down, right? So if they have a problem, you know what they're doing. They're dealing with it. They're ignoring it, possibility. They've come up with their own possibly bad solution to it. Maybe they have a good solution to it and your solution is going to be better. It doesn't matter. Whatever's going on in their life right now, they're dealing with it because they have to. And if you're going to show up with a solution to what's going on in their life, it had better be better than the way they're dealing with it right now. Now, I've got lots of problems in my life. One of my problems in my life is that I have a shoe that I tried to fix and I got some glue on the shoelace. And what that means is every time I go to tie the shoelace, it always hangs up as I'm pulling the shoelace tight, where the glue is. And it's like super annoying to me. I mean, just it just gets hung up every single time. And that is a problem in my life. But you got to ask yourself, how important is solving the problem that your customers have to them? The glue on my shoelace, not a big deal. I mean, it's a big freaking deal when I'm tying my shoes. I'll tell you that much. But after I'm done tying the shoes, it's like a non-starter. I would not spend any money or go to, you know, all I really have to do is replace the shoelaces. Can we be honest? Or even worse than that, probably I got to do is go get something sharp and like scrape the glue off the shoelace and then I've got no problems. But clearly I've not been motivated enough to do that. So if you created a, a glue scraping tool and offered to sell it to me, first off, I'd be very appreciative. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, that'd be great. But I would not buy it from you because it's not that big of a deal to me. So for your customers, the problem that they're facing or the opportunity they want to take advantage of has to be enough of a big deal that they're willing to select your product to solve it. And the question is, of course, you claim your product's going to solve their, their issue. How? How's it going to go about doing it? And is it going to be better than whatever way they're dealing with it right now? It had better be because if it's not, they're not going to touch it. If they get your product, if they implement your product, what's the value they're going to get? How is their life going to get better because of what you've provided to them? And finally, why would they buy your product? Okay, what's the promise that you're making to them when you sell them your product? Man, convincing those customers looks like it's like a lot of effort. So, what's the value of what you've come up with to solve customers' problems? Good question. You know, forget you, forget your product. Quick question, what do your customers value? That's sort of where you got to start from, right? One other thing you can do is put yourself in your customer's position. Pretend like you're the customer. As a customer or stakeholder, what creates value for you? What would you want or desire? Think of a value proposition that you experience today. Hmm, okay, value proposition you experience today. Well, I'll tell you what, we all have cell phones, right? And an interesting question for you is, why'd you get the cell phone that you currently have? <laughs> it might be it was the cheapest thing available. That's always a possibility. I don't disagree with that. But assuming that that isn't actually what's going on, okay, then let us assume you got it for some other reason. Um, my old cell phone was really old, and this was a new one. It is a valid reason to get a new cell phone. <laughs> Maybe not the best, but it is valid. 
Um, it has it has three cameras on it. I can see far away, I can see regular, and then I can see super up close. Perfectly acceptable. Uh, tons of storage. That could be it. Faster. I think faster is one that a lot of us use as a justification to get a new cell phone and stuff like that. Uh, it runs the latest and greatest version of the operating system because most of the older ones, they, they cut them off at some point in time, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So there's all we all have our own <laughs> perhaps made up justification for getting a shiny new cell phone. Right. But the people who make the cell phone had a value proposition and you bought into it. Right. First thing you need to know is what are value propositions? OK, I'll go with that. So a value proposition, simply put, it's, it's a message that communicates to you the following things. Why should you buy the product? OK. If you buy it, how are you going to go about using it? And finally, if you buy it, what do you what do you actually get? <laughs> Does it come in one package or 12 packages? Is it as big as a refrigerator like or as small as a book? You know what? What? What am I actually going to get? Your value proposition has to communicate this to your customer. What makes a good value proposition? Well, a bunch of different things. First off, clarity, of course. If you make me think <laughs> about why your product's good for me, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to take the time to think about it. Sorry, you lose. Er, it has to communicate specific results that the customer will get. you got to be real clear. If I shell out some bucks to Amazon for something, I better have a clear understanding of exactly what I'm going to be getting for my investment. Okay? Your product is probably not the only product that I can get. I can probably get other products also. Why should I get yours? What makes it different? What makes your solution better than anybody else's? And can be read and understood in five seconds. Well, you know, sadly, that is probably true. I don't have tons of time to worry about trying to figure out why you think your product is the best one for me. I'll give you a glance. I'll scan your value proposition. But I ain't reading a paragraph or multiple paragraphs or page or however long you took to write it out. Nope, not going to happen. you got to get your message across to me extremely quickly. Otherwise, I'm not paying any attention to you. It'd be nice to say that every product that's created is a runaway success. Woohoo! <laughs> that's not true, though. Products fail, and guess what? They fail all the time. There's products failing around you right now. All right, so what are we talking about here? Why does a product fail? Well, short answer is it doesn't fulfill basic need. The people who put the product together made a mistake. Doesn't uh, meet the customer's need. So the customer does have a need. Congratulations. This product does not match it. <laughs> Sorry about that. The new product idea isn't effectively communicated and marketed to the intended customers. So customers have a problem. You have a product that solves the problem. And somehow those customers aren't getting the message about your product. They don't know about it. They don't know about it. They don't buy it. The product is not a success. And finally, so in other words, customers did not need it, did not work, and did not get the message. Any one of those threes happens, you can pretty much kiss that product goodbye. It's not going to be a success. So let's think about a company that's always successful, that's never had a failure, right? Hmm. Like, let's think about one where like people like line up, willing to sit outside a store for hours or days to get their hands on the latest and greatest new product. And what kind of product, what kind of company would that be? Um, well, Apple, of course. Apple does a great job with their products, right? Everybody likes Apple products. Man, just put it on the shelf and it's going to fly off the shelf, right? Well, most of the time, but not all the time. So about halfway through the 1990s, somebody at Apple got the idea that its Macintosh hardware could be used to create a platform for video gaming. 
Not like that's not been done before. Thank you very much. Yeah, that actually sounds like a pretty good idea, right? So they saw that Sony was having some serious runaway success with their PlayStation. And they basically said, oh, we can do that. <laughs> we'll match it. Come on, bring it on. Bring it on, Sony. And, you know, Apple's a big company. Let's do this. So uh, Japanese Bandai parted with Apple. Okay, partnered. They announced the Pippin game console in late 1994. Quick question. Have you ever heard of the Pippin game conference console? I'm reasonably well aware of stuff going on in the world. Dear God in heaven, I never heard of it. Okay, so they announced it in 94, and then they didn't release it until two years later. What up with that? Okay. Apple provided the hardware. Macintosh Classic 2 components running Mac's System 7 operating system. So that's all pretty well proven technology. Nothing really risky there. I mean, I'll tell you what, every time uh, Sony cranks out a PlayStation, they've got like cutting edge chips in there and stuff like that, and they're taking risks. But anyway, so it was uh, well understood hardware. Bandy designed the case and they looked after the marketing. So basically Apple provided the hardware and the other guys did all the other work. No problems. When the Pippin launched in the U.S., it cost basically $600 in 1997, okay? Huge problem with this product is that Bandy was the only company making games for it. And no matter how many games they crank out, they can't crank out as many as being made for the PlayStation, right? And of course, surprise, surprise, sales were terrible, okay? They sold 12,000 units in the U.S., and I know you and I think it's look at 12,000 and go, well, 12,000 is a lot, right? But you got to remember, slap an Apple logo on it <laughs> and you'll sell 12,000 of it. People will just snap it up just because it says Apple, right? There's what, uh, 312 million people in the US? 12,000 is nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, ultimately, they sold, I think, 42,000 worldwide. Okay. But remember, they were selling this little baby for $600. PlayStation cost. $300, half, and had all those other games, okay? And of course, PlayStation had also sold 102 million units. PlayStation a success, Pippin a failure. So attempts were made to license it as a set-top entertainment box for hotels. Ooh, that's a little bit of a kiss of death right there, but it didn't work out. And Apple pulled the plug on his video game aspirations by the end of 1997. Please note, that it launched in the US at the beginning of 1997, and they killed it at the end of 1997. <laughs> it did not have a long shelf life. So they recognized that this was not a successful product quickly, and they killed it. So, you know, and that's Apple. Apple doesn't make mistakes. Well, they made a mistake here. It just didn't match people's needs. And so it just was not a success. Now, if we stick on the Apple theme, <laughs> remember, Apple does a great job with stuff, right? Those earbuds pff, flying off the shelf. Uh, what, iPhone 12, I think it is? Yeah, pff, gone like, quicker than you say goodbye. And they just re-released their, uh, their laptops, right? Brand new one with brand new chip in it and all that sort of fancy stuff. Man, they do a good job of stuff. But they also got some stinkers, okay? So Apple decided to launch the HomePod. Okay, why? Well, because they saw that Amazon had a Lexus and they saw that Google had their uh, home smart speakers. And so Apple said, man, we can play in that market. Boop, let's do this, okay? And we know every time Apple decides to do something, they take the market. Thank you very much, appreciate it, we'll do very well. In the case of the old HomePod, it hasn't really worked out the way Apple wanted it to. So. First thing they did was they screwed the launch date. They missed the 2017 Christmas period. Oops, okay? And that's when all the products fly off the shelf. People buy pretty much anything around Christmas, right? But they missed it. And instead they launched it in February of 2008, basically a month, two months later, right? Man, we are so burned out after Christmas. We're not buying nothing in February and bad time to launch a brand spanking new product, right? And by the way, we already stocked up on all of our Amazon and Google speakers. We don't need no more speakers from Apple. It has a price tag of $349. Dang, that ain't cheap, okay? And you know, when you also consider the fact that Amazon and Google were pretty much throwing their speakers at us because they wanted to get those darn speakers in our, in our house, right? 
and Apple's, I'm sorry, Apple's going to come on along at 350 bucks and say, if you want one, you got to cough up some serious cash. Uh, I'm not motivated. Um, Siri wasn't able to keep up with Alexis or Google Assistant, and Apple didn't support third party music services. And that's sort of huge. I mean, these things sit around and you say, yo, go play something. You expect it to be what Spotify or something like that coming out of there. And if, if you can't do that, then it's going to be a little bit slim. Um, this hurts even more, right? So their speakers, which are these little round things, apparently were marking up wooden tables when they set it on. That's that's not going to be good for people who like their tables, man. Uh, what do you got to do? You got to put like a coaster under it or something like that, right? Apple doesn't release any sales numbers, but they think they've got like a 6% of the share of the U.S. smart speaker market. And you go, well, 6% ain't too bad. Well, yeah, but remember, Apple doesn't really get involved in anything unless they can like own or dominate the market. And remember, 6% means that people bought this thing simply because it had the Apple logo on it. Remember, there's enough crazy Apple fans out there that just put an Apple logo on something and they will buy it. They don't even care what it is. Buy, 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 buy. And apparently it's about 6% of the market for home speaker people were willing to do that. Anybody who really sort of has a choice, they're probably going to get a Lexus or a Google one, okay, and say, thanks, yeah, I, these, I can actually hook these into the rest of my house. This one's going to sit off in the corner by itself. So two products made by Apple, a fabulous and wonderful company, no question about that whatsoever, who makes really good products, but clearly they've dropped the ball twice. So they've actually dropped it more than that, but they, they make bad products. They release them poorly. They do a poor job of marketing. They don't meet our customers' needs specifically, and they they struggle with pricing, right? So even Apple, a great company, does make mistakes. So products that are successful, yay, often many times have value propositions that you will recognize. So let's think about some value propositions that you recognize. Let's see, one would be FedEx. Remember when it absolutely positively has to get there overnight. What else we got? IBM, Global Solutions for a Small Planet. Kayak, Search One and Done, that's the uh, search site. Chrysler, imported from Detroit. Lexus, Passionate Pursuit of Perfection. Snapple, natural beverages made from the best stuff on earth. And I think there's one more, Visa. It's everywhere you want to be. We, we're all familiar with these phrases. We've heard them a thousand. <laughs> they spent some serious marketing messages to make sure that we recognize these phrases, right? But they're actually fairly good. I mean, because we do associate them, for example, with Snapple. We know that one, all right? And we think highly of Snapple just because of that phrase. So when you're talking about products, you have a bit of a balance thing going on here. You've got promise, credibility, and differentiator on one side, and you've got risk, price, and effort on the other side. And as a person who's responsible for a product, an entrepreneur, shall we say, your goal is to strengthen your value proposition. Okay. And exactly how can you go about doing that? Well, you need a little help. The question the customer's asking is, in terms of your product, what's in it for me? Why should I believe you? And, of course, why are you any better than anybody else? Okay, so those are customer questions. Meanwhile, on your side, how much effort is it going to be for the customer to use my product? Good question. What will the product end up costing? And of course, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> That's sort of a big question because oftentimes there's a lot that can go wrong, right? You want your product to be a success. You don't want your product to be a failure. Uh, I think I have a little video here someplace from our good friends at State Farm. And let's take a look at it. Now, I got to be careful here because. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, I don't care. Uh, do I have the. 
Hang on. I think I have to be able to share my audio, so I apologize. Let me just see if I can get this together here. A little bit of a Teams challenge. We like Teams challenges. All right. Is there... Hey, cool! I just got it. So give me two seconds here. I we watched exactly four and a half four and a half seconds hey, of this. Neighbor? We will try one more time. Okay, this will be good. We should have uh, audio, so that'll be even better. Always a challenge to get teams to line up and do what it's supposed to do. Here we go. All right, what was it? Uh, mm -hmm. White is on your side. Oh, wait. Uh, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Guess not. Hey, neighbor. Jeez. What seems to be the problem? Oh, well, my car broke down. Well, we can fix that right now. Anytime you need me. You just let me know. Anytime? Shoot. Uh, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Oh, hey, neighbor. Hey, Jake. Uh, can you go get the remote for me? Sure. Thanks, Jake. And the gecko would walk around with his big key and tear into the cars and take a knife and stab all their tires, shouting, 15 minutes! Hey, oh my goodness, what do you need? I just need some toilet paper. It's right behind you, seriously. Oh, whoops, thanks. Can you give me a towel? A little higher. Hey, Jake, uh, there's a spot right there. Oh, I'm done. You can go to Allstate. I don't care. That's fine. I'd rather be in their hands anyways. Alright. With the key there being, of course, uh, <laughs> State Farm has a, a very clear message, right? Saying that they're there to assist their customers, <laughs> sort of no matter what. Okay, so that's their promise to their customers. What else we got going on here? So promise is a key part of the State Farm message. Tupperware is all about credibility and good news, of course. I believe that we have a uh, a Tupperware video. So let's take a peek. Oop, here we go. Uh, yeah, I do not want to do that. Thank you. Chink. Now, today's Through the Decades Retro Spectacle. From the brain of a reclusive inventor to a staple of post-war America came Tupperware. The picture you are about to see is the story of a dynamic part of a remarkable new industry. It is the story of Tupperware. A product that tapped into a nation, turning its focus from foreign battlefields to the home front. One yearning for modern conveniences yet ingrained with the sensibility born of wartime rationing. Tupperware is made from polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene, relative newcomers to the wonderful world of imagination and industry. In the perfect analogy of the time, a plastic built for military use became a marketing force thanks to a trained and motivated army. Only this time, the foot soldiers wore heels and hosiery. The end of World War II came in an instant. Just like that, an entire generation reversed course. The men were coming home, and the women, celebrated for their time in the workforce, were sent home. At the same time, Earl Tupper was trying to get his new plastic products on store shelves. Tupper was a New Englander, always looking for his next big invention. It was his Wonder Bowl with its patented burping lid that would make its mark. Hear that whisper? 
That's Tupperware's airtight promise to keep food's flavor fresh. But it took Brownie Wise, a young mother and divorcee from Detroit who never went to high school, to come up with the marketing plan that made Tupperware what we know. Now let's go to a little town in New Jersey where things are really popping. Yes, there's a party going on at Mrs. Betty Martin's house. It's a Tupperware party, and it's really fun. In the first half of the 50s, Wise's Tupperware parties took company sales from $200,000 to $100 million. The number of women selling Tupperware also exploded from 200 dealers in 51 to 9,000 just three years later. The biggest sellers would gather for annual jubilees, complete with classes, prizes, and promotions. The Tupperware party stood in stark contrast, the familiar image of the door-to-door -door salesman that had dominated the early 20th century. Tupperware is one of the brightest stars in the plastics industry, an industry that did not exist 25 years ago. Until Tupperware, plastic was usually smelly and brittle. Tupperware also possessed a unique duality by being both thrifty and a status symbol. You can freeze it, stack it, any which way. Yet, as Americans moved to the suburbs and embraced a new consumerism, Tupperware was new and modern, a symbol of the new middle class. These days, Tupperware has become such a part of our fabric, its name is synonymous with its many competitors. And the direct sales parties, pioneered by Brownie Wise, are once again in vogue. But Earl Tupper's invention remains an integral part of a nation finding its footing after the Second World War. And there we go, Tupperware. Credibility, right? It's been around forever. I suspect we all <laughs> have some Tupperware. And it may not actually be a Tupperware brand, but we got the same concept of uh, something plastic that you can store food in laying around someplace at our place, right? So congratulations, Tupperware. You've uh, made your way into literally everybody's home. Uh, credibility. So Tempur-Pedic, in case you don't know who they are, they make mattresses, okay? Uh, sleep number? I think they might, I, can't, I don't know. But anyway, they make mattresses. Uh, the most highly recommended bed in America. So what, 94% of tempur owners like their mattress. So that's good. 92% of them say that they get their best night's sleep. Very impressive. Nine out of 10 would buy one again. So that's impressive. And on the average, tempur owners tell 14 people about their mattresses. And so I looked it up. I was like, wow, that's telling an awful lot of people about your mattresses. wonder why they're doing that. Well, it turns out they're telling them about it because their mattress cost them roughly uh, about $4,000. <laughs> Tempur-Pedic mattresses are not cheap. Damn, four grand for a mattress. But yeah, but people seem to like them. So hats off to them, man. That's, you know, congratulations. But geez, I didn't know mattresses cost that much. Ugh. I'd be going to bed every night thinking, <laughs> I better get $4,000 worth of enjoyment out of this mattress, thank you. All right, uh, pizzas. Lots of places to get pizzas, lots of different pizza stores. We can agree that each one of the pizza stores tries to come up with a unique message in order to attract us, right? So what are their messages? Well, fun and entertainment, cheap buffet, more for less, ingredients, and family pizzeria. We recognize the messages, but can you match the pizza operation with the message? We'll start with the very first one. For fun and entertainment, we're gonna talk about pizza. Who are we talking about here? Come on, you know who it is. Come on, it wasn't that long ago that you were going. Here we go, one, two, three. You got it, it's Chuck E. Cheese, man, right? CC's, of course, is cheap buffet. Go in and just, just load up. Just keep eating. No problems whatsoever. We'll keep bringing them out. Little Caesars is more for less. Basically cheap pizza, right? Papa John's is all about their ingredients. And, of course, Pizza Hut is trying to get the whole family to show up, right? And, by the way, we can include a lot more, right? Uh, what do we got on here? Domino's would be on there. Mm, anybody else? There's got to be other major ones, but yeah, but you get the gist of it, right? There's a lot more pizza places, and they all have their own particular why you should buy from us message. 
Usability, always a big deal, right? Okay, so Celtic cameras was designed, you know, back in the day, taking a photo was a pain in the butt. <laughs> We've seen those those old time ones where they have to put the thing in, they took the picture, they have to take it out, go treat it and all that stuff like that. So Kodak, their big breakthrough was they made it easy, right? Made a camera where you just had to push the button, it advanced the film, you could take another picture, right? That was sort of an innovation and that's what they did. There's another company called OXO, which I had no idea who they were. And it turns out that they make kitchen utensils. And their big claim to fame is that they have good grips. It's easy to hold on to their stuff. So they're very proud of that. Convenience as a selling point for a product. So who makes products that are convenient? Well, one is, of course, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Remember, those are the guys who offer to come out and pick you up if you need one of their cars. That's pretty cool. 7-Eleven, <laughs> the classic inconvenience, right? Oh, thank heaven for 7-Eleven, right? I'll take another slushy, please. Um, the REI company has some interesting policies, right? Every item you purchase there is 100% satisfaction guaranteed. You can return or exchange your item by mail or by walking into any one of the retail locations. Doesn't matter whether you purchased it online or whether or not you got it at a store. And I think I have a video that talks about these guys. So let's take a peek. Did you ever wonder if there was a different way to live life? This is the story of 23 people who did. 23 people who found an answer to that question in the mountains. 23 climbing buddies who made a choice to shape their lives around what they loved, which led to a simple idea, to build a business around a life outside. And because they loved mountains more than money, they formed a co-op. So what is a co-op exactly? It starts with you. Because a co-op is made up of members, in our case, millions of members. Members who come together for a common cause. Members who are actually owners and have a voice in what we do. Members who share in the co-op's profits and choose to give and get back every year. Because when you spend a dollar at REI, you're investing in the outdoors and helping people get outside. Bottom line, a co-op is a business that puts purpose before profits. And more than seven decades later, we're still proudly a co-op. We're still happily searching the world for the best gear we can find. And we're still in it together, but with slightly more than 23 friends. Most importantly, we're still driven by the belief that it's in the wild, untamed, and natural spaces that we find our best selves. So if you're still wondering if there's a different way to live life, we think there is. Join us. Well, thank you very much. It makes me feel good about buying REI products, right? Did you ever wonder if there's a different way to live life? Definitely. We already did that. Thank you. But yeah, so I feel good about purchasing REI products. And apparently they will take back anything that they sell to me for a reason. I'm not uh, uh, pleased with it. So I would truly get peace of mind from buying from REI. Good price. So... An interesting thing, you know, we don't think too much about where cars originally came from, but back in the day when they, when Mr. Ford and other people started to crank out cars, one of the interesting things is that um, Mr. Ford was smart enough to realize that different people would want different cars and people would be pay, willing to pay different prices for cars. So Mr. Ford, relatively quickly, he obviously made a Model T right after that, but then he made a lot more models. So he made a lot of different models with a lot of different features in order to appeal to a lot of different people. So Ford Motor Company had a lot of different cars that people could buy, and people did buy them a lot. <laughs> but each one of his different models obviously was priced differently. And so if you didn't have a lot of money, but you wanted a car, Good news, Ford had a price, I had a product for you. If you had some serious cash and you wanted to show off to the neighbors just how well you were doing, Ford had a car for you. You could go ahead and buy it and, and be the show off in the neighborhood, right? So even back in the day when cars were just first coming out, you could get different cars for different prices.
problems and solutions have to fit. All right, so if you have a solution, you have to provide evidence showing what customers care about before you can focus on how to help them. You have to design value propositions that are going to address those jobs and pains and gains that the customers most care about. And finally, you're going to have to provide evidence showing that your customers care about how your solution that you deliver through your product takes care of their pains and hopefully creates gains for them. And those are some key words there. So in the real business environment, we have to worry about external environment, which helps you to understand the context in which you'll create your solutions. The business models, which help you to create value for the business that you're working for. And finally, the value propositions. And those are how you create value for your customers. So this is a fancy picture here. Basically, on the left-hand side, we're showing how we create value, okay? We've got products and services. Our goal is to relieve pain on our customer size, and we want to provide gain to them. On the right-hand side, we see that we have our customers, and our customers are a mix of different things. <laughs> they have pains in their lives. They have things that make them happy, gains, and they've got a bunch of things that they have to do in their lives, and they're willing to purchase products to make their pains go away, to maximize their gains, and to allow them to accomplish their jobs. The question about your product that you always have to be able to answer is, hey, does your product help your customer do more gains? And are you taking care of any pains that they're currently experiencing? Pain is effectively a customer problem. Gain is a customer solution. And solutions are better than problems, right? Your customer wants to have more gains in their life <laughs> than they have pain. And inertia or doing nothing is where things start for them. So what about your design? Your design is one of the many critical pieces necessary to build a product. You start with the design, obviously, right? It's part of a value proposition that you're making to the customer. Why should customers care about your design? Great question. What is the problem that you're trying to solve. I'm not sure why we said problem at the end, but yes. What is the gain that you're proposing? You gotta be real clear about this to your customer, right? So this is a big old fancy thing, but all it really shows is that effectively that your product has three components to it. A benefit, a feature, and an experience. The benefit is what your product does. Features are how does your product actually do what it does? And the experience is, What's your customer going to feel like when they're using your product? Meanwhile, over on the customer sides, they're a mix of wants, needs, and fears. What are their emotional drivers of the purchasing? Why are they going to buy something? In my case, if it's shiny and has buttons on it, I'll pretty much buy it. Okay, pretty much. If you can turn it on, I'm going to end up buying that particular product just because that's my need. <laughs> my needs are uh, what are their hidden needs? What are the rational drivers of purchasing? And what are their fears? What, what are the risks of switching to your product? Which is a good point. If they're already solving a product a problem using another person's product, going over and use, starting to use your product is a risk because they're going to walk away from the solution that they know, right? And if they're not solving the problem, then you know what do people currently do instead of solving the problem? <laughs> Ignore it, <laughs> not talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, when we're back to that main picture, right? This is the concept. We want to maximize the customer's gain. We want to minimize their pain, and we want to provide products and services that allow them to get their jobs done. All right, we're here to the crux of the matter, my friends. Entrepreneurship, what is your team's assignment? Well, let's talk about that, because this is what you got to turn in. Ready? Here we go. Oh, got to have a robot to help you. Okay, cool, and here we go. Your team must create a series of three slides that capture your projects, your robots, value proposition. Okay. Slide number one, you're going to provide a one sentence each for the promise, credibility, and the differentiator of the robot that your team is going to create. Slide number two, you're going to provide a one sentence each 
for the price, the risk, and the effort associated with your design. And of course, slide number three, you're going to create an ad complete with at least a slogan and an image that pushes your value proposition, oh, any one of those, to your customer and convinces your customer that your product is the one that they want. Got it? So you're on hook to create three slides. Got one that shows promise credibility and differentiator, one that shows price, risk, and effort, and a third one, which is an ad that has a slogan and an image saying why your robot is better than everybody else's in the class. What makes you so special? And you gotta upload it to Canvas and it's due by 326, which is Friday. In fact, I think it's actually due tomorrow, right? All right, so you got today and tomorrow to get this bugger done, then you gotta upload it to Canvas. It's only three slides, can't be that hard to do. Got to get the team together, got to make sure everybody's on board. Get their input for promise, credibility, differentiator, price, risk, and effort. Shh, bring it on, okay? So you're on hook to create three slides, <laughs> excuse me, and turn them in by Friday. How can we optimize the value proposition? Got to be thinking about this one, right? Provide more compelling benefits provide independent data or proof points, add or strengthen points of differentiation, incredibly important. You want to reduce real and perceived effort to buy, deploy, or use. It's got to be easy, right? Eliminate or reduce perceived risk to buy or deploy or use. And of course, change the pricing model if you need to. No problems with any of those. You want your product to be excess. You do not want it to be a failure. Fantastic information. This one came from a bunch of interesting sources and we appreciate all their guidance. So that's taken care of. Now, I think I'm still on the hook as I think about it for about four and a half seconds here. So I need to provide you guys with a word of the day and I apologize. I was going to be like super good about this and I forgot about it. So give me four seconds here. And amazingly enough, I will come up with a word of the day. Give me one moment. Here it comes. I see it coming. Do, 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 do. I think that'll do it. Yeah, that should do it. That should not be a problem. Here it comes. Hang on just one moment. Almost there. I did do it. Well, who knew that? Not me. All right. Boom, there you go. Our word of the day today is newspaper. All right, so remember you're on the hook to send an email to the TA. Make sure the subject of the email says newspaper. When you send that to the TA, the TA will know that you were in class today. You'll get full credit for showing up because you were smart enough to know that the word of the day today was newspaper. Send the email with a subject line that says newspaper. All right. Woohoo. And we are good to go, guys. All right. Fantastic. You have an assignment. Your assignment is due tomorrow. So you need to get together as a team. Got to crank out those three slides, get them turned into Canvas. By the way, just a real quick heads up for you. Apparently, I think at least earlier this morning, Canvas was having some problems. So just uh, keep your eyes open, stuff like that. I think it, I think people were eventually able to log on, but I think it was actually working really slowly. That may all be taken care of by now, but I just know that earlier today, some people were having problems with Canvas. So just be aware. All right. Does anybody have any questions for me? Going once. Going twice. All right. The weekend is almost here. How exciting. I can almost touch it. Okay, almost, almost. Remember, weekends are dangerous times. Keep washing those hands. Keep wearing the face masks. Keep staying away from other people. Stay healthy.
and I will see you guys back in class on Tuesday. All right, guys, have a very good weekend. I will see you then. Bye now.